I'm extremely pleased and honored to be speaking to you. I've had a long-term relationship with the Fellowship of Reconciliation, partly because uh, we both have this intense interest in spiritual nonviolence. And as you may be aware, uh, in 2005, Rabbi Michael Lerner and I put on the Spiritual Activism Conference in Berkeley that 1,400 people came to, and that was considered to be a really big launch. Uh, at that event, I told the following story that Jim Forrest, when he was the head of IFOR in, uh, this is part of a sound and light show that goes on. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Jim was, uh, he came back from an international peace meeting in Italy, and he, he was kind of shaken. And I said, Jim, what, what's up? And he, he said, well, I finally figured out the purpose of the peace movement. I said, for heaven's sakes, Jim, tell me. You know, I've been doing this now for a quarter of a century. What are we here for? And he said, the purpose of the peace movement is to take the angriest people in the world and keep them out of the military. <laughs> uh, I uh, really, I was so pleased with FOR that I did do a pilgrimage when I was in Cologne, Germany. About eight years ago, I went to the railway station and I went to famous Bahnsteig Sieben, you know, track seven and stood there where uh, Mr. Hodgkins and Mr. Siegfried Schulze had done the famous handshake that started this August organization a hundred years ago. And I'm also pleased to say that it was uh, FOR that published the first version of this book. It was called Steps of Nonviolence. It wasn't nearly as handsome as it is now. And uh, I want to say a little bit about it because once I get started with my talk, I forget to do the advertisement. Uh, uh, no, the word from our sponsor. Uh, <laughs> uh, this book is short, which is uh, a great advantage. It's inexpensive, which is an incredible advantage. And um, it represents the distillation of everything that I've been able to kind of put together about the basic strategies of nonviolence in my whole you know, career of working on this so intensely. I, the reason for this book really came about in June of 1989 when the terrible massacre of students took place in Tiananmen Square. I was sitting with some colleagues. We knew that they were making some mistakes and we knew that they were endangering their lives and there was nothing we can do about it. There was no internet at that time. We had to sit there and watch the tanks roll in and kill all of... <coughs> Sorry, and kill all of those young people. I was the active professor at the time. Students were and still are very dear to me. And the incredible frustration of knowing that we, we could have helped if only we had somehow been able to reach them has led to this lifelong search to distill the best practices of nonviolence. And the motto of the Meta Center is to help people practice nonviolence more safely and more effectively. So with that, let me launch into my talk. I feel a little bit like Richard Nixon in a funny way. He, he, he once got up and said, I know I don't look like him, he, <laughs> but he once uh, got up and he said, before I give my speech, I'd like to say something. <laughs> <laughs> So, so there I said it, and now let me begin my speech. I, I really don't have much of an excuse for showing this beautiful little fawn, uh, but as I, I had to, I was asked to give a TEDx talk on the subject that we're going to be talking about today, the new story, where does it come from, the centrality of nonviolence. And I had to reduce everything I've been working on for the last 30 years into 18 minutes. I said, how am I going to do this? I looked out the window and there was a doe acting a little strangely and I walked over and sure enough, this little guy had just been born and so it inspired me and I thought it might put us all in the right mood for this talk. Well, let me begin with a story. Uh, how many of you know who this lady is? 
We, sh we should all know this woman and we should know the story. Her name is Antoinette Tuff. She's approximately the most appropriately named human being <laughs> on the planet. She was a bookkeeper in a school with about 800 students in Decatur, Georgia. A very deranged young man who was off his uh, psychotropic medicines came into the school with very heavy weapons, assault rifles, and so forth, all the stuff which is so easy to come by in this country. And planning mayhem, he snuck through the, the security door and um, he was confronted by Antoinette who looked at him and said, uh, gee, I'm so sorry, you, you really look troubled. I have troubles too. You wanna to hear about my recent divorce? You know, everyone has to go through trouble in this life. And I think you're gonna be fine. I think you're gonna make it. And I love you, she said to him. And she gradually talked him down and uh, told him, please, why don't you put your weapons up here on, the, on my desk? So he did, and she said, lie down and tell me when you're ready and I'll call the police. <laughs> <laughs> which he did, he, he lay down, obediently put his hands behind his back and she called the SWAT team, which was standing outside and they came running in. And you can actually hear the 9-11 tapes where they come in making absolute ass of themselves. You know, All right, everybody, get down, you know, put your which she had already done. So uh, she became a hero, and, and she's writing a book. That's what heroes do. Professors also <laughs> write books. <laughs> now, this story was covered in the newspapers, but the meaning of it was not. And so this is part of what we're doing at Meta Center. We've recently trained 1,300 young people in South Africa to interpret news and to make their own news so that the meaning of these stories gets out. The meaning of the story is, in my humble opinion, we had two security systems in place at that school that morning. One was a very expensive system that failed. That system consisted of an electronic security gate and a SWAT team. The SWAT team actually made matters worse. When they showed up and started shouting and firing outside, they almost destroyed what Antoinette Tuff was doing. The other uh, security system was Antoinette, a, a human being who was trained to recognize another suffering human being. She had a minister who had told her, had given her a grounding technique uh, that helped her do this. And it, uh, the story, if you ask me, is that we're spending millions and millions of dollars on a failed system and we're doing nothing to develop an appropriate system, a beautiful system, which worked. Let's give you another story really quickly. Uh, this was in a Walgreens parking lot uh, two years ago, I think. There was an elderly woman, a little bit disabled, got into her car, and a young man jumped into the car and pointed a gun at her and said, give me all your money. She said, young man, Jesus is with me in this car. Uh, if you shoot me, I'm going straight to heaven, and you're going straight to hell. And the conversation continued a little while longer. And finally, uh, the, the, the fellow started crying, which is actually fairly common in these cognitive dissonance situations that are caused by nonviolence actors. Uh, he started crying and he put the gun away and started to get out of the car. And she said, wait a minute, young man, and reached in her wallet and gave him all the money she had, which was ten, $10 or something. <laughs> And, and again, the story was reported, but the meaning was lost. The point of the story was that this, this woman, who had not had the opportunity to take my course, as far as I know, she, um, and incidentally, when that, that course was, it shows you what kind of hunger there is for nonviolence, when that course went up online, in the first six months, there were more than 100,000 people had watched. I won't say they watched the whole course, but they had tuned into it and it's still available on our website. And actually in August, we're gonna do the course again, but this time not at the university. Oh no, we're gonna do it at the Meta Center and webcast it from there. So I love teaching, but I hate the university. <laughs>
But where were we? I'm, I, this was a terrific cliffhanger. We're waiting to hear the meaning of the story of this poor old lady. She, as I say, she had not taken my course, but she did the perfect nonviolent thing spontaneously. Again, it shows we have this capacity within us. In fact, the more I deal with nonviolence, the more I've begun to realize, and it really has only come clear for me in the last few years, that nonviolence is the absolute core of what we are as human beings. So she had this spontaneous awareness and ability. And what she did, if, if we could only have somebody interpret it for us, what she did was she absolutely refused to accept the model of reality that this young man was offering her. Namely, he was saying, we are radically separate. My happiness can be built on your suffering. And she was saying, absolutely not. We are radically connected. Your happiness and mine are united. They are interconnected. And I'm happy to help you, but not under coercion. Not accepting that model of separateness, but affirming the model of connectedness. So uh, if we ask ourselves why the journalism is so bad, OK, we're not going to be so terrifically surprised about this. I had a student of mine at Berkeley who became a journalist at the San Francisco Chronicle, and she told me that their motto is, if it's news, it's news to us. <laughs> <laughs> but, but there is a deeper reason behind all of this, and that the reportage is, is so lacking, I guess is the word I'm looking for, because we're living in the wrong story. We're living in a story of reality which says that the world consists of matter. And because it consists of matter, it consists of limited resources. And because we also consist of matter, we are radically separate from one another. And we are doomed to compete for those ever scarcer resources and therefore the devastation of the planet and war and the economic uh, imbalance and all the rest of it all comes from this wrong story. And there are people who have begun to realize that it's the story that's the problem and have been working on getting a new story. This is a, a quote from one of those people, Thomas Berry. Uh, the, we're obviously going through the deep crisis of the kind that Barry describes, where our story is inadequate for the present situation. In fact, I would say that it's worse than inadequate. It's, it's devastatingly misleading, this story of materialism and separateness. And it's not hard at all to tell where that story is coming from. This is an advertisement I picked almost at random. See this young dude in the sports car here? I'm trying not to be jealous. Uh, he, <laughs> but he's, if you just look at the look on his face. He's got the look of an action hero and is driving some kind of very slick car. I've cut out the brand name of the car, so I won't be sued. Uh, and as you can see, the exciting thing about this is that his heartbeat is matching the engine RPM. And just in case you don't get the point, don't just drive the car, be the car. Be a machine. And if lest you, lest you think that this is just a one-off, according to recent studies, we're exposed to somewhere between three and 5,000 commercial messages a day. You know, it'd be, it'd be less than 1,000 in Seebeck, Washington, more than 6,000 in Tokyo, but somewhere in between, most of us see three or so thousand messages a day that are telling us we are empty, we're separate from one another, we need to compete, we need to buy more stuff, and so on and so forth. So that's where what we call the old story is coming from. Now, you might have noticed I put quote marks around old story because really it's fairly new. It started in the Industrial Revolution, which in, in geological times was just an eye blink ago. The new story is intimately bound up with nonviolence. Uh, it, again, I don't have much of an excuse for showing this picture, but there's Martin Luther King being a very human human being with his family. And it was he who said, 
we must rapidly begin the shift from a thing-oriented civilization, which is what we have become primarily through the advertising modality of the mass media, to a person-oriented civilization. And as I say, I've noticed over and over again recently how personhood is identified with the capacity for nonviolence. Recently, Christian Peacemaker Teams was talking with a Kurdish activist in Iraqi Kurdistan who said he wanted to mount a major nonviolent campaign. The CPT person said, um, you know, I guess he wasn't as well trained as FOR teams are. He said, yes, uh, you can do that, but you know it's, it's difficult, which is true. It's, it involves some risk, which is true. It takes longer, which isn't true. We just discovered that it's about a third the time if you do things through nonviolence, but they didn't know that. And the Kurdish gentleman said, yes, all of that is true. I know it's going to be more difficult, more risky, take more time. But he said, you don't lose your humanity in the process. And while he was saying that, we were recently passing that barrier, that landmark where more American servicemen and women have committed suicide than have been killed in combat. And again, we are clueless as to the reason. Oh my gosh, they must be under stress or something like that. <laughs> like, like, we're not under stress? Come on. Now, the reason is that a friend of mine, a psychologist by the name of Mary McNair, some of you may know, has uh, discovered a concept called perpetration-induced traumatic stress. It's the pits. Perpetration-induced traumatic stress. And it, it states that we are much more devastated by what we, what we do to other people than what other people do to us. And it's taken us... The, the army will refuse to acknowledge that this phenomenon exists because it puts them in an impossible quandary. We ought to be shaking it in their face every time we get a chance. Look at what we're doing with basic training is basic dehumanization. So where are we going to go for, quote, a new story? Actually, this is a fairly easy question to answer because the new story has been around forever, if you will. And we even have a name these days for the tradition that it comes from. It's called the wisdom tradition. And it's a, an eternal inheritance that every one of us uh, can claim. It's the vision of these great sages uh, and mystics. And this is just one testimony from an anonymous document from the 14th century England called The Cloud of Unknowing. Beneath you and external to you, that's an important point, external to you lies the entire created universe. Even the sun, moon, and the stars, they cannot compare to your exalted dignity as a human being. So this is the story that we need. And just to show you that it's not only an ancient story, this is a statement very, fairly recently from an Indian sage, Swami Ramdas, who actually came to this country in the 1950s in order to help us not have the Third World War. This is, this is really such an important summary of who we are that I'd like to dwell on it for just a minute. On the physical plane, man is but an animal. Okay, let me stop there for a second. I've had a couple of conversations with very prominent, creative, brilliant people, much more successful uh, in their fields than, well, than I am, for example. Uh, one of them is a well-known economist who runs an organization in Bainbridge Island, not far from here. No names, please. Uh, <laughs> the other one is a colleague of mine from Berkeley who is a very, very well-known linguist, He's written a lot of books, and they have both said to me at New Story conferences, when we are trying to get this, this, quote, ancient New Story out, they both said, well, look, we are animals. And uh, fortunately, I'm a nonviolent person. I would, but I wanted to shake them up, except one of them at least is much bigger than me. So I didn't. I wanted to shake him and say, our bodies are the bodies of animals. 
but we are mind, body, and spirit. And when you just keep saying we're animals, you are saying that we're back in the old paradigm, which is to say that we're physical beings trapped in this competition for scarce resources, et cetera, et cetera. But look how much further Ramdas will go. On the intellectual plane, the human being, she or he, is a rational being. That's, that's nice, you know, I made my living that way for a number of years. People would ask me, you're a professor, what, what do you do? And I said, well, I, t I take simple ideas and make them complicated enough so that intellectuals can understand them. <laughs> but, you know, you can make a living at anything, my grandmother used to say. <laughs> On the moral plane, we are a power for good, and he goes even further than that. On the spiritual plane, we are a radiant being full of divine light, love, and bliss. And he goes on to add that we are not finished yet. Humanity's ascent from one plane to another is its natural movement. So this is the quote, new story. It's already there. It's in every imaginable language and all kinds of different idioms and images. The problem is uh, that we don't believe it. So we need we need to do two things. We need, and this is going to, this is a kind of a mnemonic. It's going to be easy for us to remember this. We need to adapt and adopt. We need to adapt the old story, to put it into language that we can assimilate, we modern people, for whom, as my friend Willis Harmon used to say, science is the knowledge validating system for us. Uh, unless we belong to the Tea Party, and we, th <laughs> you know. but if you don't think that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a Tyrannosaurus Rex, <laughs> you mostly believe in science, and if something cannot be validated by science, it, we're going to have a hard time accepting it. So we need to adapt it to language we can understand, and then, which is an even harder part, we need to adopt it. We need to make it the worldview through which most people see the world. So that when an Antoinette Tuff does what she does, we can interpret that, we can understand it, we can build upon it, we can institutionalize it, and then, then our problems will be over. So it just so happens, unless you believe in God, in which case you would say, by God's grace, we have just the two things that we need to do the adapting and the adopting. To do the adapting, we have this incredible revolution in science that's taken place in about the last 30, 35 years. And to do the adopting, to make the new story real, to make it how we see the world, that's where nonviolence comes in. Because for years I've been saying that the new science and the new story are helping us to establish and explain nonviolence, but it's also the other way around. That the fact that nonviolence works shows that we must be having the wrong image of the human being. If we were just material objects separate from one another, et cetera, et cetera, on that animal plane, there's no way to explain why nonviolence is so effective. So I want to talk just a little bit about what the new science is and uh, some of the newest developments in uh, nonviolence, which mostly you're probably aware of. Uh, I got a few experiments I'd like to uh, tell you about. Uh, incidentally, we're trying to build a page on the Meta Center website which will summarize some of the most important findings of the new science, because I think it's an extremely valuable resource. But one of the best researchers is Franz de Waal, who's a, a Dutch uh, primatologist. He wrote a book called uh, Chimpanzee Politics, which I thought was a description of the White House, but actually <laughs> it's a description of his chimpanzees at the Arnhem Zoo. And uh, they did this following experiment. They had a colony of rhesus monkeys. Now, rhesus monkeys are pretty aggressive critters, as you can see from this picture. Of course, I've chosen the picture to show this, but never mind. Uh, here's another, I think I recognize this one from, <laughs> <laughs> I, I met this one in Brooklyn uh, <laughs> 10 years ago. 
So they had these real aggressive monkeys and they introduced, that's going to sound a little bit unkind, they introduced stump tail monkeys, who are much more like FOR monkeys. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you can see, they love their kids, they're kind and gentle. And the, uh, their fear was that, you know, the rhesus monkeys are just going to wipe up the cages with the stump tails. Well, the first of three big surprises was that the stump tails actually prevailed. Rhesus monkey would kind of come up to a stump tail and say, hey, get off of my branch. You know, the stump, stump tail would say, I'm not leaving. Uh, I was here first. If you have a real problem, you want to bite my finger, go ahead, bite it. But I'm not getting off the branch. You know, nonviolence 101. And uh, in a short period of time, to the amazement of the researchers, the stump tails had established themselves and refused to be cowed down by the, quote, more aggressive rhesus monkeys. Then, this is incredible, the rhesus monkeys actually started imitating the stump tails. So stump tail culture, in the, <laughs> this cultural nonviolence, right? Stump tail culture prevailed over rhesus culture. And they thought, wow, this is incredible. We're going to get at least three PhDs out of this. <laughs> Now let's pull the stump tails out and see how long it takes for the rhesus to go back to their bad old ways. So they took, pull all the stump tails out, and the rhesus monkeys are still being stump tail-like, the last we've heard. So peace culture is not only more potent, but more robust than, non -viol than violent culture. And this has also been shown from games theory and many other places. I'll mention just one other experiment uh, just to show you the, uh, the, how this is opening up new vistas. Uh, the fact is that if you sit in front of a computer screen and they flash a face on that screen, and that face is a person from a different race, your limbic system will get activated. That's a system way down in the animal brain, the reptilian brain, actually. It has a little almond-shaped entity in there called the amygdaloid nucleus. And when it fires up, you go into a fight or flight response. So this is an unfortunate fact of evolutionary life. Right? I'm sitting in front of a screen. They show me a picture of someone that I don't know from a different race. The amygdala gets hyperactive. Now, the two researchers at Princeton, who probably not by coincidence were two women, uh, Mary Wheeler and Susan Fisk, decided there's got to be a way around this. And they thought of something that was incredibly brilliant. And I'm surprised that as professors, they were able to come up with something so simple. <laughs> it, it, it was this. They said to the subject, OK, this is a test. We want to test your acumen here. We want you to tell us, does this person like crunchy peanut butter or smooth peanut butter? Incredibly stupid question. <laughs> and they, so they would do this over and over again. And you know what? It completely suppressed the amygdala response. It went that deep. It went back 300 million years in evolution and, and stifled that response. And the explanation for this is, is pretty simple. When you ask yourself a question like that, you're looking at the person as a human being, as an individual not as a member of a threat category, other than me, different, compete, and so forth. So once again, changing to a human, a person-oriented civilization. And this process, incidentally, is what psychologists call priming. You prime the subject with a particular question, change his or her mental set, and that changes the result of the experiment. And so you might look at advertising as incredibly bad priming that we're giving ourselves on a social level. So um, I guess I don't need to say much more about that particular experiment, but uh, there are incredible uh, is results now coming in in many, many fields to the point where we have new 
fields of science altogether, positive psychology and so forth. And I would really urge that all of us become familiar with this because it's extremely useful material. If you haven't guessed by now, I'm, my purpose here today is to recruit you into be new storytellers. And this is the one of the ways that we're going to do it. So let's go over now to the nonviolence side of the equation and ask ourselves what's what's new since Gandhi and King, in other words, roughly contemporaneous with this explosion of positive science in the last 30, 35 years, the discovery of mirror neurons and all of those things. Uh, at the same time, parallel discoveries are going on in nonviolence. First of all, there's an enormous quantitative spread of nonviolence, as all of us in this room know very well, because Walter Wink and Richard Dietz wrote about it in uh, Pieces of the Way. Uh, and in Fellowship Magazine, there was a very important article called The Global Spread of Active Nonviolence, which showed that if you just do population counts, slightly more than half the world at that time had experienced a major nonviolent event or campaign of some kind, many of which had been successful even by worldly standards. But in this book, I argue that we need a different set of criteria to discover, to evaluate whether something is successful or not. But even by worldly standards, most of them succeeded. And that was written before Arab Spring. So I used to go around saying, by now it's probably two thirds of the world. And just last week, I read an article by Jack Duval from the International Center for Nonviolent Conflict saying, there is hardly, and he is not a dewy-eyed romantic. Jack Duval, if you know him. He's not a rhesus, but he's not uh, a, 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 a sop either. He said, there's hardly a society in the world today that has not experienced some kind of at least strategic nonviolent uh, episode. So it's everywhere. The term is coming up, uh, though not as much as we might like. In Petaluma, when I was Starting to look around for the meta office, I went into a lawyer's office and they had a room to spare and they weren't paying much attention to me. I just walked into the room, I looked at it, came out. As I was walking out, a woman behind the desk said, uh, so what do you do? What do you want this office for? I said, oh, well, we have a nonprofit. She said, that's nice. Still looking down at her paper. Uh, what do you do there? I said, well, we, we promote nonviolence. She, what? <laughs> What, what kind of violence? <laughs> so we're really not quite there yet, but the phenomenon at, at least is growing. And there are at least uh, five qualitative things that are different and helpful. The first is that there's an enormous amount of research not just the new science research that I was just referring to, but I'm sure most of you are familiar with this book by Erica Chanoweth and Maria Stefan, documenting that of almost 300, what they call transitions to democracy, we used to call them revolutions, but now they call transitions to democracy, 56% uh, of the nonviolent ones were successful and 23% of the violent ones were successful. So we are now starting to ground this scientifically. More important than that, I believe, as a frustrated activist, is the phenomenon of transmission. Uh, read any book from the 70s or 80s about the peace movement and they will tell you the problem with the peace movement is that it has to reinvent the wheel every time there's an event because there's no way of learning from one event to the next. That is now changing. Uh, for example, there's an organization called Center for Advanced Nonviolent Actions and Strategies, which took the successful student-led uprising leaders from Serbia from the year 2000 and had them bundle up what they had learned and make that available. They were in Egypt. They were, they were I, I think they were even some of them in Iran. There's some difficulties with that organization. But the fact is, we're now beginning to realize that this is a human capacity it, it, we're, we are all potential Antoinette Tufts. It's a human capacity and we can learn it and develop it. And so this is a really big breakthrough. 
there are also new institutions, which again, you know uh, about as well as I. Here are two fellows, Derek Oakley from the UK and Andres Gutierrez from Central America, who are part of the Nonviolent Peace Force uh, team in Jonglei State in South Sudan. They, they don't pick easy conflicts to go into. They were in a UN uh, IDP camp, you know, internal displaced persons. It was attacked by militia. They went and took shelter in a little hut. They discovered that there were four women and nine children in that hut. The um, militia burst in with their uh, AK-47s and axes and sticks and saw these two, you know, obviously non-Sudanese. They're somewhat uniformed, uh, fairly official looking people and said, get out of here. Uh, Derek and Andres were well trained. They had done their uh, teamwork. They all had to do was glance at one another. They knew exactly what they were going to do. They simply looked at these people very calmly and said, we are not leaving. The militia threatened them three times and three times they said, I'm sorry, we're not leaving. The militia turned and went away. And so, yeah, you, you look at this picture, you ask yourself, why are these men smiling? They're smiling because they just saved the lives of 11 people. But they're also smiling because they have just shown a way out of the war system. And they're also smiling at the deepest level because they have upheld a deeper, newer image of the human being. Where people going to a country where they're not even the same race as the people there and risking their life solely for peace, that's a different image of the human being than what we've known before. So to go back to our story, we also have new demographics and new actors. The women's movement has been incredibly helpful. And indigenous people now have networks by which they are able to uh, get involved in global events without losing their diversity, without losing our identity. And finally, we have the creation of the new story, which I've been talking about. Um, this is. I hope this is the right slide. This is part of our roadmap uh, project, which we'll be talking about in our workshop this afternoon, where we have attempted to bring nonviolent Gandhian principles to bear on the present movement and see if there's a way where, without losing our diversity, we could get the energy of a, sim a single concerted movement. And th it, there's a a trajectory from person power, our term for personal empowerment, to constructive program, to uh, nonviolent resistance, or obstructive program, satyagraha. We, we stumbled on this ourselves, and then we went to Birmingham, Alabama, and had a three-day workshop with Narayan Desai, who had grown up in Gandhi's ashram. And the first day was on the personal practices and meditation stuff in the ashram. The second day was on constructive program. And the third day was on satyagraha. So we said uh, we, we must have stumbled on something. And this uh, person power area, we have settled on five practices, which anyone can do, which we believe would make us more effective peacemakers and nonviolent actors, and therefore, in a way, get us a step closer to our own personal fulfillment as human beings. And the first one is the most unpopular by far, and that is avoid the mass media. I think you agree. <laughs> yep. You want to get a little bit more uh, finessed, you could say, don't expose yourself to images of human degradation, but it amounts to the same thing. Uh, this will create a vacuum in your mind, which uh, the Meta Center will then come, <laughs> come over the hill waving its banner and say, hey, we can help you uh, learn, about, learn everything you can about nonviolence. It's actually a substitute culture, an alternative culture. Get a spiritual practice. Say a little bit more about that in a second. Try to relate to everyone personally. Our civilization has caused us to be so isolated from one another. In fact, even those who are big fans of social media have started pointing out that, you know, you walk down the street and people are listening to somebody else or <laughs> not looking at you. 
Uh, okay, I don't want to dilate too much on that story, but and then finally, this this I think is very important. Tell the story. Now, uh, Nick Rockefeller once tried to recruit a, a very wealthy friend of his into being an economic hitman. Come with me. We'll go down to Guatemala. We can destroy the economy of the whole country. Just a snap, you know, and we'll make millions. And to his surprise, this uh, wealthy friend of his who had been investing with him and so forth said, uh, no, I, I don't want to do that. And Rockefeller said to him, why do you care about those people? Now, by and large, when we hear something like that, we say, you know, OK, if you, don't, if you have to ask the question, then I can't explain it to you. <laughs> you know, but I'm thinking that we should be able to explain it. Because people complain, you know, the, the Republicans have their own story. They have this horrible little story. They keep telling it over and over again, and it matters. It counts. So we also should be able to articulate, in a, and this is what we're going to be practicing a little bit at the workshop. Well, OK, if someone says, why do you care about these people? Because we're all interrelated. Life, it turns out, is not made up of separate material particles as I was taught in high school a long time ago, but rather because we are body, mind, and spirit, we are all interconnected. And if I hurt you, I'm hurting myself. You may not believe me, but anyway, that's where I stand. That's why I'm not going to do this with you. So uh, Gandhi obviously was one who had a very deep spiritual practice. He called it prayer meeting. but. Uh, my spiritual teacher actually got started as a seeker by going to one of these, quote, prayer meetings and seeing Gandhi go into a state like this of complete absorption. And it was because of that that he was able to hit on this incredible scheme of picking up a pinch of salt in April of 1930 and bringing down the British Empire. Un unbelievable. But he had the insight to do that. And it's because of that that he had the ability to win people over. These are the wives and workers of the Lancashire steel mills. He had put them out of a job by boycotting British cloth. And they warned him, don't go there in 1931 in Lancashire. And he said, where? I want to meet these people. <laughs> and it took him about half an hour to explain what he was doing. You know, he said, you have. 300,000 unemployed. I have 300 million unemployed and things like that. And at the end of it, you have this scene, which I call Ip Ip or I. <laughs> so uh, we and Thich Nhat Hanh also said that you may believe in nonviolence, but unless you have some meditation practice when you're facing the dogs and when they're hitting you with the sticks, that belief is going to go out the window. It's just relatively superficial. You need to ground it every day in a, in a practice. And if you're looking for one, we may have some suggestions. I will help you. Uh, the deepest wisdom doesn't come either from scientists or the wisdom or the wisdom traditions, sages and saints. It comes from bumper stickers. And this one was tacked onto a, gu a guitar that was hanging on the fence of a friend of mine's front yard in Tamales. We are not human beings having a spiritual experience, which is a very Californian thing to believe. <laughs> we are actually spiritual beings having a human experience. I will say no more about that just, just now, but I, we have developed what we call charka points. It used to be called bullet points, but that's too violent for us. So. <laughs> <laughs> so the, these are spinning wheel points, which we propose that if, if we were to assimilate this, uh, make it our own, and use it whenever we get an opportunity, even sometimes when we don't get, into, get an opportunity, you know, just walk into a bar and say, you realize that we're body, mind, and spirit? <laughs> <laughs> And there are four things, I think, that would probably, and this is a work in progress. If you have other suggestions about what are the basic charka points that we should be promoting, uh, I would be more than happy to hear them. We really are 
I, I really feel that if we get people talking about why we're doing what we're doing, the combination of the effective nonviolent action and the plausible explanation could be very, very powerful. So those points are the unity of life. Which was, I think, Kristen, you were saying last night about Thich Nhat Hanh, talking that we inter are. And I didn't make up the slide after I heard your talk. I already have this. And that we uh, are not determined by our DNA or our neurons or hormones or anything else. But this is what the, the newspapers will just about once a day they will report on a scientific experiment that says that you are Republican because of this gene, or you like crunchy peanut butter because of that hormone. And uh, it's, it's totally untrue. We have this irreducible free will as the priming experiment of Wheeler and Fisk were able to demonstrate. We have tremendous inner resources which are constantly uh, concealed from us by this advertising that we need things from the outside world. And of all of those inner resources, I would say the capacity to be nonviolent and to respond to nonviolence when we encounter it is a deep, a deepest, perhaps the deepest part of our human nature. So I put this before you as a, a version of the new story, which if you feel comfortable with it, you might want to adopt. And I'll just uh, close with a little anecdote. If I can get through it, it often causes me to get emotional. <laughs> Professors are not supposed to do that. But <laughs> uh, the day after Gandhi's assassination, 1948, there was an American journalist in the south of India who was overwhelmed. Uh, be, imagine being in a subcontinent with nearly 400 million people every one of whom was going through a paroxysm of grief. He had never experienced anything like it. He went to one of his Indian friends and said, what is going on here? And the man said, well, the people believe that there was a mirror in the Mahatma in which was reflected the greatest that we are capable of. And we are now afraid that that mirror has been shattered. So, the story that I have been trying to share with you this morning is that the mirror has not been shattered. It's been covered over with a lot of dust. And perhaps this will be a way for us to blow away some of that dust and realize who we are. Thank you very much. So what is Roadmap? As a project, Roadmap has three phases. And we are about about in the middle, or about one and a half way into the project. The first part of the project, which came directly out of Hope Tank conversations, was to develop this beautiful mandala that you see behind me, which is a schematic representation of the entire progressive movement, as you can see. And the second part of the project was to create a web-based tool through which people working on any part of the roadmap could connect with people working on that issue. So let's say, well, let's just take by, you know, arbitrarily, you're interested in peace. Why should anyone be interested in peace? But you are. So you click on that little dove uh, uh, icon, and that clicks you through. Well, right now, what you'll find is a Facebook-based blog uh, of people who are interested in that issue. But eventually, what we'd like to do is to make it a kind of visual database of other groups working in that issue. So people who have signed up and said they don't mind being contacted by others will appear there on a kind of map, and you'll be able to get in touch with them and share resources, like to say, OK, I'm a terrific web designer. Someone in, the, in this area needs web design. You, connect up that way. And more importantly, even than that, I think, start to share resources. So here are best practices for promoting peace work. Uh, here's things that we found don't work. Here's things that we want to wait on, uh, etc. And so that'll be phase two. And we're almost there. I think we need to raise a little more money. And uh, <laughs> 
get another phase of the web design completed. So we're working with a group called Loka Shakti that has almost this functionality already. I, I can't tell you exactly when, but I think that before long, you'll be able to go on and connect through to other people who are working in the area that you're mostly interested in. I understood, we're all interested in different areas and at different times you may wanna connect up with other groups, that's fine. So that's phase two. Phase three, this is where it gets really exciting and I guess I don't, I know the least about how this phase is going to work, but the point of phase three is to come up with a long-term strategy, a strategy for the entire movement. And uh, uh, just keep that on hold for a little bit and I'm gonna go back to the beginning, work my way up to that and I'll tell you how, how we think that that might work, okay? So any questions so far? I mean, what I was gonna do next is kind of go up to the mandala and show you what the different sectors are, why it's designed the way it is. So here is uh, how this thing works. The issues that we need to address to change the world, to get the great turning to happen, to get to the new paradigm, whatever we wanna call it. We spent a lot of time filtering that down to six basic areas. And the area that we put top dead center, because we consider it the most important, is what I was talking about this morning, the creation of a new story, creation and adopting of a, a new vision of who we are and what the world is, what we're supposed to be doing here, et cetera. Now, each of these six sectors is divided into three subsectors. Those are only for example. There, there are many, many, the, it, projects that you could put in there. Gandhi had 18 projects in his constructive program. So we thought this is a magic number. We wanna have 18 also, so we do. But that was just you know our self-indulgence and you don't have to pay too much attention to that part. But we feel that peace, democracy and social justice, the economy, and then climate and the environment we gave separate sectors to because of the extreme urgency of the climate issue. I mean, there's one thing that all of us agree on is if we don't resolve that one very soon, I mean, even in my lifetime, there will be no more issues for us to resolve. So for that reason, we broke it out into two. Uh, now, the, this is where it starts to be very Gandhian. We propose that this be regarded as a centrifugal trajectory, that all of us are going to do something about our own personal empowerment. It would be through, and here's where we suggested those five points this morning of avoiding the mass media, learning everything you can about nonviolence, get a spiritual practice, relate very personally to others, create a person-based civilization, and then finally, find your passion is the way we put it in this version here. Where do your strengths and weaknesses most closely match the needs of the world? And what we would now add to that is to use every opportunity to tell the new story. And we're gonna be doing an exercise about that shortly. So uh, at this point, we actually numbered these stages. We, we don't necessarily mean that these things have to be chronological. If you're working on something urgent, like climate change, we're not saying drop everything, start meditating, go to Tibet, you know, and come back when you're illumined. It's not like that. But above all, we should never neglect personal development because that's how we lead to burnout, lack of discrimination, and so forth. So, um, yeah, I think that's all I need to tell you about how the mandala works. Oh no, that isn't. <laughs> I forgot one of the neatest things. And that is that Gandhi had a concept called Svadeshi, which meant, <clears throat> suppose you could roughly translate that as localism, and it meant working within your own sphere, and when you had done your job correctly in your sphere, your capacities would expand and you'd find yourself able to work in a broader sphere. But he was very, very serious about Swadeshi. People 
would come to him and say, I want to join the movement. And he would say, where do you come from? And the person would name a village. And Gandhi would be familiar with that village because he had visited so many of them. He would say, your village is a mess. Your village is a cesspool. For you to come and join the national movement and leave your village in that con condition would be a sin. You go back and work in your village. And the same could be applied, and he did apply it, to our personal capacities. Like we have strengths and weaknesses, we should be aware of them, working on them. When we do our job in that circle, however small it may be, our capacities will expand. And without being conscious of it, this uh, centrifugal model is a very good Swedeshi model because here, and we're actually going to imitate that in our workshops starting in a little while, here in person power you're working on yourself. It's very Swedeshi. In constructive program, you're working with your friends to build the things that you need, getting together with your community members and so forth. When you've done those two things, then you're ready to confront the powers that be. And of course, we designed this as a kind of reaction to Occupy, which went exactly the other way. So let's start by protesting at the biggest scale possible. And then when we're thrown off the street, then they discovered constructive program. At least they did that much, because a lot of people, when they fail at a big outside circle, at a, or they fail when they start by means of protest, they often give up. And many, many a movement has gone through that cycle. So it, much to their credit that they went on to discover um, Occupy Sandy and Occupy Jubilee and things like that. But uh, there's a great strength that comes from starting with the smallest possible circle and then nobody can prevent us from self-empowerment. And it's, it's entirely within our purview. We don't have to join an organization, form a new 501c3 called the Michael Nagler Improvement Project, or whatever. And then to get together with people to build the things that we want is a very powerful predecessor to saying we don't want the things that you, you have built. And uh, if you get a hold of my book, you'll see that I devoted a chapter to Constructive Program because it is so often overlooked and is so powerful.